Uh, this is the most scientific slide in this uh, PowerPoint now has AI generated design. Uh, that works well. Um, yeah, I'm going, I got in touch last year actually about um, talking about uh, industry interest in safety critical rust and, and methods to provide that. And uh, this is so this is the, the talk from uh, last year updated for this year. Who are we? Uh, we're Sabri Blackmon, who's um, it's about joining. He's been a little bit held up. Um, Sabri has been working in safety and security critical systems, um, military robotics, prior assurance, and uh, connected devices. And um, yeah, me, I'm part of the Rust core team. Um, I've joined the project through the community team, and I'm currently one of the project directors in the Rust Foundation. And I have a history in uh, software development and high reliability backend systems. And um, the company that I got in touch with is called Fair Systems, uh, as introduced. Um, we have since then, in September, formed a subsidiary called uh, Critical Section, and um, which helps high reliability in industries to adopt Rust. Um, so, the background um, this is probably the least rigorous talk in this workshop. Um, but our intention is to break some common assumptions about like what's out there and um, present a couple of pathways on how the things that were presented and that I just had a, a, a was viewing are um, also uh, are very, very useful in the current path and in the current development of Rust. Um, so we want to summarize the feedback that we got from around three years of consulting on Rust adoption and also especially um, through our background in safety critical with uh, some um, uh, some of the customers we were interviewing or uh, especially interested companies. And um, then as it turns out, there's actually a lot of subtle opinions around, around industry needs. Um, so this is basically an accidental interview study. Um, we sometimes blog about this and get a lot of replies from people um, who we can interview and which we usually follow up on. Um, one thing that we figured out is that there's an interest in Rust from two sides. First of all, what is now coming up as a term, which is called mission critical, which are places where higher confidence levels in a programming language are actually needed, um, but uh, where there's no regulatory concerns, where, for example, no ISO standards or something apply. And safety critical, where extreme long-term um, developments are um, uh, it, it, extreme long-term usage of those tools uh, is of interest, places like automotive, medical, industry, avionics. And there's actually interest in Rust and quite a bit. So spoilers for the safety critical parts, Rust is not there yet, but we found that a lot of um, companies internally are trying it out. Um, they're tracking the progress of Rust and pretty often they're tracking from year to year um, did the things that we feel missing get better or worse? And um, the feedback that we're getting is, oh, actually it's getting better. And a large part of that is also um, the verification story around it. And there are multiple projects that we are aware of that are actively being implemented in Rust that are targeting those industries. Um, so I estimate is actually that Rust could be there in one or two years, like the upper end of that, uh, where we could see first deployments in lower safety criticality just to be clear. Um, so to address a couple of elephants in the rooms, uh, the first one is whenever we talk about it, everyone's immediately about, okay, let's talk about a Rust specification. The interesting thing is there's currently no strong industry need for an ISO specification of Rust. It is of interest. It helps qualifying thing compilers, but the immediate need is qualifying. Is it possible for us to um, acquire a version of, for example, Rust C that is well understandable and where we know where the bugs are um, and all of the, these things. And um, so needs for qualification are actually much more the inspection of the organization that ships the software, the creation of the workflows and how that, uh, those qualification artifacts are built and the assessment of what is the current level and how much we can trust, uh, for example, Rust C. Um, and that is, for example, also often not reachable without previous use in lower criticality levels. So if we're talking things like ASL, um, a to ASLD, um, you should spend some day, some year, uh, some time in A and B. Um, but there's a strong need for understanding. And there's 
in all of those debates, we see uh, a problem coming up that sufficiently strong formalization through any kind of formal methods is actually close to a specification. And this is something where the line gets blurry again. So um, trust levels come with the understanding of the software at hand. And that is something that we think is currently the more useful debate to have is like, how can we improve trust in Rust? step by step because that's a much easier to achieve goal and we already done that in some ways so feedback that we got was also okay there's no formal specification but there's the rare rfc process um, it is an open source project but it has a security response group since day one and all of these kind of things actually build these kinds of um uh trust things and our check boxes there um, and there's an industry need to improving those levels, given that these industries start adopting uh, Rust. So there's also a kind of a, an, an existing um, uh, an, an existing wipe there um, that um, has a life on its own. One thing that is often discussed is, uh, yeah. Evolution speed, the other elephant in the room. How much is it a problem that Rust is released every six weeks? And there, the opinions are actually split. I was surprised that they're not all conservative. Um, the the conservative option is uh, view is obvious. We can't requalify our software always that quickly. But the progress of uh, one is Rust already has a predictable change uh, change process and change control process at a six week speed uh, to make that work. Um, that could be improved. Um, because, and that's the other thing, we are moving into a space where uh, safety critical systems are not fully um, disjointed from, um, from the rest of the software, for example, on a car. And so there's a need to actually increase the update and patch cycles and not work with, for example, the programming language edition from six years ago um, that later went, uh, went uh, to qualification. And stability was also something that people took a subtle stance on. The programming language stability is very much of interest. But when you go down to, for example, a lot of the things that um, people here are doing on um, verifying mirror and all of these kind of things, there's much more an air of, yeah, we can do with breakage there. But the problem that we currently have and that we have across the board with all compilers is we would, we would like to have an intermediate representation that wouldn't break every, every uh, couple of weeks or even worse, like basically at random. So um, we struggle to find a good word for this concept. For now, we settled to addressable. So being the, looking at the artifact and being able to say, OK, this was generated by Rust 1.52. Um, and we know, uh, the, we know the intermediate representation of that one, and possibly with documentation on what breaks from, from version to version. Um, all of those vendors are perfectly willing to deal with um, uh, with multiple backends for uh, the same programming language. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of strengths there. An, an actually well-architected modern compiler, and that has something that we actually got as feedback without telling people, and that was interesting that people were looking at Rust in that kind of detail. And also, and more in social effect, a curiosity for methods that are within reach, but a little out of the ordinary um, on, on what the current state is. Um, and for example, compiler vendors that we spoke to, we're very surprised that Rust already has facilities for backends that seems like that are a, a defined interface, not a stable interface, but a defined interface um, that you could, for example, plug into. And I don't know for what reason, some weren't expecting that. Um, the other elephant in the room, other compilers. Um, surprisingly, um, many said that it is a strength that currently Rust is the uh, Rust C is the only major implementation. We're not talking about in ten years here, but um, they, everyone is okay with that. A grown programming language at the beginning just has one implementation. Um, but there's also a high interest in little, as little divergence as possible. What that is informed of is that, especially in the embedded industries, for a lot of niche targets, there was a habit to fork GCC and at some point lose uh, the chance to follow uh, the main GCC or just lose track of the main GCC. So a lot of people are running on very old compilers. Um, but there is interest in targeted compilers for high criticality use cases very, very 
niche uh, use cases where you, for example, want to maybe fully verify compilers, something compiler like, for example. So the whole topic of the specification comes up again and again, right? Uh, that and there it, it becomes up, uh, comes up more and more. So do we need a specification at some point? Maybe to an extent, maybe for parts of the language, because at some point, what is Rust compatible? Like how can I check if I'm Rust compatible um, will become a question and that's the point where this becomes a relevant question where we need to talk about a specification. Um, but one thing that I would like to note there is there's an interest in, and that's really fuzzy as a statement in modern specification practices. And like, this will be like, if you really start specifying the language, that will be something that will probably live on for decades and the method will live on for decades. But it's not like any, anyone has said like, this is, this is what it would look like. So that is, that is a good question uh, and a, a good research question. What is a, what is the specification in 2020? Yeah, uh, verification, I have accidentally uh, covered on the side that um, verification is often done on mirror, but I am, I am in the room with some people that I, that I actually had chats about. Um, and I think this is the, the one that is um, very commonly known here. Um, so mirror becomes a very interesting target to invest in, I think, technology-wise, the whole area of the compiler internals and the intermediate representation. Um, so, and the, the, the thing that we came away with is where there's a lot of verification efforts around Rust, um, but that begs a little bit the question on whether the core product of the compiler would support it better. So essentially, what if Rust C were not just an compiler, but also appreciated the use cases uh, presented here in giving uh, giving hooks and um, and interfaces to do these kind of things, maybe with different uh, uh, different guarantees and not part of the language um, interface, but um, more um, as something that yeah becomes a like, becomes a normal uh, normal thing to investigate in the in the product development. Yeah, so. That's it for me. I hope there's still time for questions. Yes, thank you very much. We do have time for questions. So one question that already came up in the chat was, when you talk about the language specification, are you talking about the formal specification or just in general, a document that describes maybe in plain English, the syntax and semantics? I take no stance on this. <laughs> I have too many hats to take stance on this. <laughs> um, no, seriously. Um, this is, I think this is something when we're talking about a specification, this is something that um, if we want to endeavor on saying we would like to move Rust towards a specification that must be, in my opinion, something that the project leads and especially also a lot of the parties that actually consume that specification um, need to be involved in um, for that uh, to properly stick um, with my Rust community team had on. I, I would love if that was a, a broad group with um, with relevant um, uh, uh, representatives from industries, um, academia, and, and other places that would consume that specification. That's a little bit of a dodgy answer. Sorry for that, but yeah. no, that's perfectly fine. Uh, any other questions? Um, so I'm curious about how interested these. Um, different users are in doing formal verification on their code, um, how willing they are to write um, formal specifications or harnesses, like model checking harnesses, sort of, and generally sort of what kind of assurance tools they're using. That's uh, all over the place. Um, that's also very different on industries. Um, one thing, for example, that is inter interesting is that, for example, aerospace does not care about anything that the compiler does. Uh, they completely um, verify uh, the artifact that falls out of the compiler and don't care about the tools. So a lot of the discussions they had about, uh, about all of this doesn't actually matter. And um, they, use, um, they use a lot of model checkers to basically like, this is all that the system can do. And uh, then it tests to it that checks whether it actually complies to the model. Um, and um, on the other hand, uh, other places rely more on the tools um, and are more interested in qualification and the tool for being correct. So what you do is you um, 
uh, you qualify the compiler and qualify all the libraries. And pretty often vendors of libraries or for example, operating systems then use formal methods for that. So there's a there's a more of a mixed field there. But for example, we've seen cell four here um, or um, or other uh, other systems used in these ca cases are, um, are using formal methods for that. Any other questions? That does not seem to be the case. Then uh, thanks again, Florian, for a very nice presentation.